got you, sorry. This one can be written similarly, except there's a minus sign. But because this is the complex conjugate of this, and this is the complex conjugate of that, I've got the sum of a number and its complex conjugate. The sum of a number and its complex conjugate is just the real part of that number. Then, this h, this eigenvalue, the system function evaluated at j omega naught, has a magnitude and an angle. If I write the system function in terms of its magnitude and angle, I can factor the magnitude out of the real part and combine the angle by Euler with the, um, the angle that generates the cosine wave, j omega naught t, and I'm left with my final answer that you can compute the output as the magnitude of a system function evaluated at j omega naught with a phase shift on the cosine that's equal to the angle of h of j, of not, j omega naught. <coughs> so the, this is the final answer. If I want to think about the frequency response, if I want to think about how this system has a response that depends on frequency, I think about the cos omega t going in, and what comes out is also cos omega t, cos omega t, except the magnitude is changed by the magnitude of the system function, and the phase is changed by the phase of the system function. That's the thing I said back on slide two. Sign in, sign out. However, the magnitude can possibly change, and the angle, the phase, can possibly change. But the frequency cannot change. Omega naught went, uh, omega went in, omega comes out. Okay. So that leads to a very easy way of thinking about frequency responses in terms of pole zero diagrams. The idea is, if you think about the pole zero diagram, if the system can be represented by a linear differential equation with constant coefficients then the system can be represented by a collection of poles and zeros. A handful of dollars. How many poles are there? How many zeros are there? And where are they? So, if I have that representation, how many poles are there? How many zeros are there? Where are they? I can think about the frequency response just by thinking about the vector that connects each pole and each zero in turn from the pole with zero location to the point on the j omega axis at the frequency of interest. So, if I have a system that has a single zero, here I have a zero at z1, at s equals z1, let's say that the zero is at point uh, z, z1 equals minus two, single zero at the point s equals minus two, then I only need to think about one vector, if I'm interested in the response for very low frequencies, very low frequencies are at omega equals zero, I only need to think about the vector that connects the zero to the point j omega equals zero, so j, j zero, which is saying it's zero. So the eigenvalue is the length of this vector, that's the magnitude, and the angle of this vector, we always measure angle relative to the x-axis, so the angle of this vector is zero. So I get a magnitude, which is that big, and an angle, which is zero, and that's plotted over here. That's my result for a low frequency, a frequency close to zero. <coughs> then if I think about a slightly higher frequency, what happens to the magnitude of the zero? Bigger. Bigger. It's the magnitude of the zero. The zeros are in the top. Bigger is bigger. So the bigger arrow translates to a slightly bigger magnitude. The angle that's made with the x-axis is now slightly positive, so that's illustrated by the fact that the angle is deviating from zero. And in general, I can think about the frequency response is just how the length of this vector changes as I change omega. The, the change in length tells me the magnitude, the change in angle tells me the phase. Same thing happens if I do minus omega, 
what on earth is minus omega? So omega was cos omega t omega, right? It had to do with how fast the motor was going. What's minus omega? Why am I drawing minus omega here? Yes. Why am I interested in these negative frequencies that don't really exist? Because I have an hour to fill and I don't have enough stuff to fill the hour. Uh, no. Why am I interested in negative frequencies? Why am I interested in negative frequencies? I'm interested in negative frequencies because they let me create sines and cosines. Boiler. I invent negative frequencies because I like complex numbers. I like complex numbers because they're eigenfunction, because the corresponding complex exponentials are eigenfunctions. Cos omega t was not an eigenfunction, I don't like it. E to the j omega t is an eigenfunction, I like it. I invent negative frequencies so that I can construct cos out of the sum of two complex things. One of them happens to be this imaginary frequency thing. Who cares? It's just a number. It's just math. So in general, we will think about positive and negative frequencies. Negative frequencies don't exist. We simply invent them to make the math easy. Okay, so generally speaking, because of the complex conjugate symmetry, you can predict what the negative frequency part of the system function will look like if you know the positive part. So generally speaking, we'll only look at the positive parts when we know the system is real, right? This symmetry only comes about when the system was real. I proved it because I knew the age of t was real factor. Okay, so now I can think about the same sort of thing, but this time with pole. The vector diagram looks the same. The shape of the curve is upside down because the pole is in the bottom. Longer arrows now make smaller eigenvalues. So now, as you go to higher frequencies, the idea is that a single pole gives your frequency response whose magnitude decays as you deviate from zero. And you get increasing phase lag. You get increasing phase lag because this angle increases with omega, but it's in the bottom. Increases in the bottom, that means it decreases. That's why the angle goes down in this case. And if you have and a zero, the answer is easily derived from the previous two answers. <clears throat> you think about two vectors, one connecting the zero to the point of the frequency of interest, the other connecting the pole, and the magnitude is the product of the lengths of those two vectors, and the angle is the sum of the angle of those two vectors. <clears throat> so you can see that the zero is slightly shorter at low frequencies, and becomes asymptotically the same length. That means that at high frequencies, the magnitude goes to 1, except, of course, I've got a constant here, so it goes to 3. <laughs> and at low frequencies, this length is shorter than that one, so it's slightly smaller. The magnitude is smaller at low frequencies. Similarly for the angles, the angles both start out at 0, so the angle starts out at 0. If you go to a high enough frequency, they both, both angles go to pi over 2. So they both angle, so the difference goes to zero at high frequencies as well. There's a little blip in the middle because the angle of the zero in
Pokemon system. Now, if I write the, so if I just write the differential equation, figure out the system function, I get a simple. Form that looks like so, second order. If I imagine very low damage. 